Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to start with some attack traffic. This is the login traffic for one of our customers. A couple of things concerned us when we first saw this traffic. One was the lack of a day-night pattern. Anytime you're looking at what should be human traffic and it doesn't follow that day-night pattern, it's cause for concern. Another concern was no matter what this customer did from a marketing perspective, television commercials, email blasts, had no measurable impact on this traffic. So they had no idea if their marketing dollars were well spent. The third thing that concerned them is the volume and velocity of this traffic. It peaks at almost two and a half million logins per hour. This customer has millions of customers, but it, that's too high, too fast. So this is what the traffic looked like prior to the application of any F5 client side signals. And let me take a tangent to explain to you what I mean. This is a replay of the user's interaction with the login form on the right. Up here on the top is a timeline left to right. Each of those tick marks corresponds to an event that's played out down here. You're going to see key down and key up events right here. You're going to see mouse movements and mouse clicks and more key down, key up events in the enter key. We take all this information, apply some algorithms to it, and generate various types of user fingerprints. Here's an automated interaction. You're going to see mouse ev or, uh, uh, key events here that are too fast to be human. And then you're going to see mouse clicks, various areas on the screen without any mouse movements. We call that the magic mouse. It's impossible unless you're doing it programmatically. This is a woman entering in her password three separate times. They may not look identical. If you break it into sections, the first three events are identical, next three are identical, next six identical, and the final uh, four also identical. This is how a bad actor enters in the same password. And you think about this, this makes sense. We develop a rhythm entering in our password over and over and over again. A bad actor could t type the correct password, but he's not going to be able to match that rhythm. This is probably the best illustration of the difference between humans and bots. On the left, you see in green uh, mouse movements and in red mouse clicks. It's hard to see, but there are mouse clicks all over. There aren't even event listeners there. Nothing happens. So when I first saw this, I was confused, thinking maybe our data were, were flawed. Then I started paying closer attention to the way I navigate, the way my friends and family navigate, the way my coworkers navigate. And we do that. You'll catch yourself doing it. Sometimes you just click the left mouse button for no reason. Maybe you, I don't know, you're testing it, but it's a quirk humans have. Look on the right. You can see the size, shape, and position of the submit button based exclusively on where the bots click. They have no such quirk of clicking where there are no event listeners. If we look at the mouse movements, think about it. As humans, we will do this with the mouse just to find it. We might follow where we're reading. Uh, we might overshoot when we're going to click a button. There's a lot of anomalies that are consistent with humans that you don't see in the bots. You see perfectly straight lines, and even when they add entropy to that, it comes across as smooth curves. If they really want to match a human as far as entropy, they'll record a human and replay the human. If we look at this, uh, like speed of left to right is speed of navigating workflow, we'll find that the bad actors, the, the human bad actors, not the bots, navigate workflows lightning fast. Quick example, if each of you pulled out your phone, launched your banking app, logged in, went to go add a payee and send money to that payee, my guess is you'll have to look for the add payee button. Not for very long, if it's good user experience, maybe eight tenths of a second, but you'll have to look. You don't add a payee every day. Bad actors add payees hundreds of times per day. They navigate, navigate that workflow lightning fast. So when F5 first goes in line and deploys our client-side signals, we take mitigating action on all the bad bots, allow list all the good bots, and then we study the remaining humans and see who is navigating workflows lightning fast. And that's where the investigation starts to find oftentimes malicious actors. In addition to behavioral biometrics, we interrogate the browser, collect things like plugins, fonts, and screen size. We apply some algorithms to all this and generate a browser fingerprint. Some of you might be thinking, look, uh, plugins, font, screen size, those things are spoofed all day long. And they are. They are spoofed all the time. Uh, but we have an advantage. Why do they spoof those signals? They spoof them to hide in the noise, but they don't know what the noise looks like. So it gives us an advantage. The real power, though, is in our additional signals. So I'm going to cover two of those. First one is our emoji signal. It leverages the fact that emojis render differently on different platforms. So if the platform is rendering emojis like Edge, but their user agent string purports to be Firefox, we know they're lying about the user agent string. And your customers don't lie about their user agent string. Similarly, some of you might recognize this top string preceded by 0x as a large hexadecimal number. We will ask the browser 
or the device to convert that number into decimal. You see it gets a number on the order of 18 quintillion. I actually had to Google how to say a number that big. It's quintillion. You'll also notice that different browsers come up with different answers to that large floating point math problem, largely because of the way they round. So just like the emoji signal, if they purport to be Firefox, but they're doing floating point math like Chrome, we know they're lying. Finally, we interrogate the HTTP header, apply some algorithms to that, and generate a header fingerprint. The powerful thing about this fingerprint is we collect it whether or not our JavaScript executes. A very powerful tool. So we go back to our login traffic, we apply the signals, and we see virtually all of it is attack traffic. And this isn't even a record. I've got hundreds of these where we see up more than 90% of all traffic is malicious bots attempting to take over accounts. There's the day-night pattern along the bottom, that small sliver of green. That's the human traffic. And it's no wonder. No wonder they didn't know if their marketing dollars were well spent. The human traffic is dwarfed by all the attack traffic. So this entirely skews company metrics, their costs associated with CDNs, with, with fraud tools, with SIMs. So it isn't just about fraud, uh, losses due to fraud. There are other costs associated with this amount of attack traffic. And by the way, uh, I can't go back, but the quote on the screen estimating 20 to 30 percent of attack traffic, when in fact it was 98 percent, that's also very common. Organizations grossly underestimate the size of this traffic because it didn't just appear one day. If you go left of that diagram, weeks, months, over a year, the attack traffic was all still there. It didn't just appear where it's obvious. So it had this slow growth over months and years. And security teams are actually quite good at identifying the top, I don't know, thousand noisiest IPs or autonomous systems. Uh, but they miss the long tail of tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands or millions of IPs that are used only once. And, you know, blocking these attacks by IP for the last 10 years is what caused them to start to become highly, highly distributed. So these attacks are coming from hundreds of thousands, even millions of IPs, and that's often why security organizations are missing them. So in yellow, we are flagging it and passing it to origin. Here we go in partial mitigation mode and full mitigation mode. So everything in red doesn't reach origin. Here's something very important happened. And this is the two takeaways today is client side signals are imperative. You have to have them. You can't do this at network layer alone. And you must have multi-stage defense. Let me take a tangent to explain to you what I mean. So we have JavaScript that runs inside web and mobile browsers and SDK that sits alongside the native app on mobile de devices. The point of the JavaScript and the SDK is to collect the signals I described, pass it through the internet to an appliance. And now the appliance is going to analyze those signals in real time and make a decision if the traffic is good or bad. We're talking about an individual transaction. If it's bad, it takes mitigating action. If it's good, it passes it on to origin. So what's missing in this picture? No bad traffic reaching origin. None. That's a pipe dream. There will occasionally be bad traffic reaching origin. Attackers retool. New tools come out. So you've got to have a second stage. Now, this is where your A and ML systems are operating. And you know, every time I hear a vendor talk about A and ML, I kind of roll my eyes. I think it's one of those things that's used and overused. If I could squeeze blockchain into the presentation, it'd be the trifecta. Uh, but we are quite good at it. Fortune put us in the top 100 in the world in our A and ML. And even though we're good at it, we recognize it is not ready to be blindly trusted making decisions on transactions. It isn't. You must have lots of humans. So you need data, you need the models, and you need the carbon units to pour over all of those alerts, making sure that the models are learning properly. And it isn't enough to find something in stage two. You then need the ability to update stage one with the newly discovered malicious traffic. And that's what we F5 offers its customers. An outcome is a managed service. Real-time defense in stage one, then stage two, looking at human-supported AI and ML, looking at aggregate transactions, the last 30 seconds, minute, 10 minutes, hour, day, looking for anything we might have missed. When we find it, we update stage one. Common question, how often do you have to update stage one? We might do it four or five times in a day if we're doing battle with a really aggressive and sophisticated, well-resourced attacker, typically across some of our federal customers. Uh, other times, it might be once every few days, maybe once in a week. You don't actually have to be under attack uh, for us to push an update. We might see an update somewhere else across the F5 network and want to proactively protect you from that attack. That would also cause us to push an update to stage one. Now, for AWS customers, 
there's a connector now that allows all of you very easy access to this sort of functionality. It was just, just released. So stop by our booth. You can learn a lot more about the connector uh, and uh, learn about how easy it is to deploy this. We have hundreds of these before and after slides. We go in line. You know, typically north of 50% is automated attack traffic. We go into mitigation mode, do battle with the attackers. After a few days or weeks, the attackers move on to a softer target. All right, so we go back. You see well, we detected the retool. We pushed a countermeasure in flagging mode, observation mode only. And then we pushed that countermeasure into mitigation mode. And this is how we address false positives. We push it out in observation mode first. We look, if we go into mitigation mode, are we going to mitigate any customers? Uh, you know, that's how we do it. And we say, no, we're not going to mitigate any humans. No good customers. So go into mitigation. It's safe. So why are they doing this? This is credential stuffing. They just take millions of username password pairs from a compromise and try them programmatically against every other login application. Because of consumer habits to reuse username and passwords, we're seeing success rates 0.1 to 3%. So when they're trying hundreds of millions or even billions of times, they take over quite a lot of accounts. It isn't just login. This is create account. You have to really zoom in to see the organic human traffic creating accounts. These are bots creating hundreds of millions of synthetic accounts on enterprises at virtually all verticals. Here's add to cart. No day-night no day pattern there. You apply the signals, you see 99% of it was unwanted bots. Why were they so busy on add to cart? It was for limited time offer sales like concert tickets and sneakers. We did analysis on a group that was doing these sorts of uh, purchases and reselling them on the secondary market. It isn't some college student making a few extra hundred bucks or a few thousand dollars uh, each month. These organizations are making millions, millions of dollars by buying them, using bots, and then selling them on the secondary market for a largely inflated price. You remove all the automated traffic. That's where you see the day-night pattern of the human traffic, and you see the organic spikes of customers who are trying to buy those concert tickets or those sneakers. Virtually all of the public-facing applications are targeted. It isn't just employee or consumer login. It's vendor login, partner login, supplier login. Anything that is public-facing, attackers will launch automation if there's a perceived incentive to do so. We call this bot defense, okay? In general, anytime you need to stop the malicious bots and gain visibility and control over all the other automation, uh, bot defense is what you'll want to use there. Now, after the noise is removed, common question is what about latency? Well, you, you have to introduce some latency to execute JavaScript, but we typically see a net improvement in performance because we get rid of all the unwanted automation. Uh, you see the large spikes in latency are due to attacks. Once we went into mitigation mode, that latency uh, improved significantly. So there's a lot more you can do. After you get rid of all the bad bots and you allow list all the good bots, now you can look at the humans. I already talked about speed of navigating workflow. Another signal is screen utilization. Bad actors don't typically use their whole screen. Uh, pasting operations into fields that you don't normally paste, like first and last name. Bad actors log out all the time. They log out because they have to log into the next victim account. Related to that is remember me. Bad actors do not check the remember me. They don't want to have to go in to delete a username to put in the next username. Uh, I already talked about floating point math and the emoji signal. Uh, we also look at the, the uh, time zone for the geolocation of the IP address, and we compare that to the time zone of the browser. If there's a difference, it's typically you know, proxy or VPN being used. I should say, one of these by themselves doesn't mean anything. It's the totality of all these signals that can paint a pretty uh, uh, incriminating picture. Uh, focus switching. This is all tab on a Windows machine. Bad actors, the browser loses focus a lot as they navigate between the browser and some other tool that is uh, facilitating their attack. Probably the most powerful uh, signal here is the network intelligence. If we see a device um, somewhere else across the F5 network engaged in malicious traffic, and then we see that same device on your web or mobile applications, chances are it's also malicious. So the network effect is really important here. Our signals allow us to do very good device identifiers. So even though we see them changing their browser fingerprint, we know it's the same device. When we see the same device attempting more than five or six accounts, that's also a clue. So we can take all these signals and in real time do a recommendation right into the HTTP header, letting the enterprise know, look, this is very anomalous. Don't let money leave the organization. Or this is just suspicious, maybe trigger 2FA. We call that account protection. Finally, what else can you do with signals? 
you can re reduce customer friction for your important customers. This is actual data from one of our customers. 20% of these people were struggling to log in. We estimate some small percentage are going to call the help desk. So there's a cost associated with 2,000 calls per day, obviously. We studied all of those login attempts. We are very confident that 6,800 of the 39 and 1,100 of the 59 were good customers. There was no reason to force them to log in again. So this customer used those recommendations and just extended their session. This is better than a password. They're doing floating point math the way they always have. They're rendering emojis the way they are. They're doing everything the way they always have, and now we're asking them to enter in a password? No. This is authentication intelligence using client-side signals to be frictionless and continuous off. This is a chart from one of our uh, customers. They did A-B testing. They had a 30-minute uh, timeout, a session timeout, and they extended it to seven days based on our recommendations using our client-side signals. You saw a 17% conversion uplift. So these are measurable results. Another customer didn't provide us with the chart, but said $20 million in additional revenue just because of session extension. So forcing people to log out and log in again, that is something that we can help you avoid altogether. All right, here are the takeaways. I think I covered everything except this. You need to harden. You're going to evaluate a, a bot vendor that's going to have JavaScript or an SDK. You need to make sure that is really, really well hardened because bad actors are going to reverse engineer it and then start spoofing all those signals, which will render the countermeasure useless. Uh, thank you very much. I'm out of time.